Fitchburg Franco Americans formed two very distinctive groups. The Acadian immigrants who came down from the maritime provinces of Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, and New Brunswick, and the French Canadian immigrants from the province of Quebec. Although their French dialects differed, as did some of their customs, both groups emigrated south with a strong hope for a better life. And today, they are simply known as franco Americans. Still stands the forest primeval, but under the shade of its branches dwells another race with other customs and language. Only along the shore of the mournful and misty Atlantic linger a few Acadian peasants whose fathers from exile wandered back to their native land to die in its bosom. In the fisherman's cot, the wheel and the loom are still busy Maidens still wear their Norman caps and their kirtles of homespun, and by the evening fire repeat Evangeline's story, while from its rocky caverns the deep-voiced neighboring ocean speaks and in accents disconsolate answers the wail of the forest. The first Acadian exodus in 1755 was brought about by a cruel and devastating deportation order issued by the British to be accepted. Many even returned to France. Longfellow, in his story, pictures this tragic time. They wandered from city, from the cold lakes of the north to sultry southern savannas, from the bleak shores of the sea to the lands where the father of waters seizes the hills in his hands and drags them down to the ocean. Friends they sought and homes, and many despairing, heartbroken, asked of the earth but a grave and no longer a friend or a fireside. More than a century later, many other Acadians left the maritime provinces of Canada, this time to seek a better standard of living by working in the mills and factories of New England. Although the Quebec French did not experience a forced deportation at the hands of the English, deep political issues and later economic problems contributed to the great emigration at the turn of the century. Between the time of the British takeover in 1763 and the 1930s, 
the population of French Canadians increased from 90,000 to 3 million. These prodigious birth rates, also known as the revolt of the cradle, la revanche du berceau, greatly contributed to the economic strain on the largely farm economy. Large families, often with 10 children or more, simply could not live on the limited land. Other non-farm opportunities simply did not exist. Conditions were ripe for immigration, particularly since the New England industries were booming and in search of cheap labor. The Southwood exodus to seek employment in New England's industries represented a major change in the way of life for the immigrants. Used to living on a farm, the strangeness of urban life was strong encouragement for French Canadians to hold on to their customs, their language, and above all, their religion. Factory work and the security it provided was a strong magnet for many immigrants. Used to earning $150 a year on the farm, if the weather was good, the immigrant and his family could now earn $750 per year, regardless of the weather. 12 hours per day of work, standing in front of a machine, seemed rather painless compared to their previous existence. From the beginning of the late 19th century immigration, Massachusetts was a haven for Canadian immigrants. In 1920, for instance, 35% of the total U.S. French Canadian population resided in Massachusetts. Most were at work in the manufacturing industries and in the mills. Fitchburg was a typical New England industrial city at the time of this immigration and welcomed the cheap labor that the French-speaking Canadians offered. 1882 began the development of Claygon where many of the city's French Canadian immigrants would ultimately live and work. Andrew Pratt, who owned a large tract of land on the slopes of Rollstone Hill, sold part of this property to John Daniels, then secretary of the city's Board of Trade. Very much in favor of Andrew Claygon's plan to build a textile mill in the area, Daniels donated the land on which the factory was to be built. The Claygon Mill was completed in 1885, and much of the required labor, 160 out of a workforce of 200, were French Canadians. As the firm expanded and merged with the Park Hill Manufacturing Company, intense recruitment by agents of the mill owners helped bring many more French Canadians to Fitchburg. By 1912, Park Hill was the largest concern in the city with nearly 1,400 employees. Once begun, Claygon grew rapidly from a cow pasture to a thriving city district with streets, factories, stores, a public and parochial school, and a Catholic church. By 1900, Claygon housed over 4,000 French Canadians. In addition to the recruiters sent up to Canada by the mill owners, emigrants returning to Canada for visits with families were the strongest influence in providing a continuous flow of labor to the factories. These visitors, with their aura of material success and their stories of the unlimited opportunities, were often instrumental in bringing an entire parish of people back to the city. An important factor in the mill owner's preference for French Canadians was they usually had very large families. And that, in addition to adult labor, these families could provide even cheaper and more abundant child labor. Although life for first-generation immigrants was most difficult, the French-speaking residents of Fitchburg, through hard work, thrift, and dedication soon raised three churches, three French language parish schools, numerous businesses and professional offices, 
as well as many strong support organizations. In time, they also became a strong force in the political process. Without a doubt, the strongest institution to provide coherence and support the French Canadians in Fitchburg was the church. It was the mainstay of la survivance, the notion of protecting French culture against the inroads of outsiders. The first French parish was organized in Fitchburg in 1886 when Reverend Father Clovis Baudouin arrived. By June of 1895, the Immaculate Conception Church was completed and the Sisters of the Holy Spirit took charge of the parochial school. However, this church still did not meet the needs of all the French-speaking people in Fitchburg. Its location, particularly, was very inconvenient for Claygon residents, who by this time numbered well over 200 families. As a result, Reverend Father Joseph Forrest arrived to help establish the new parish of St. Joseph. By 1900, the church was completed along with the parish school. A third French church was raised in South Fitchburg, the St. Francis of Assisi Parish. It too came into being because a large group of French Canadians were now living and working in South Fitchburg and needed their own church. This parish too built a school. The first pastor was the late beloved Reverend Father L.A. Longwalk. The parochial schools associated with the churches were probably the most important institutions in the preservation of the French-Canadian identity. However, the early days of these parish schools were difficult. The Fitchburg School Board would not approve these schools because part of the curriculum was taught in French. After closing the Immaculate Conception School, the same fate seemed to await St. Joseph's School. The Reverend Father Charles Janot became pastor at St. Joseph's, and he decided to press the resistance to the school committee edict. After losing in the lower courts, the case of Commonwealth V.S. Frank Roberts was finally tried in the state Supreme Court, and the subsequent ruling in June of 1893 finally made it possible for the French parochial schools to exist. Beyond the parochial schools, there was a need for higher education. Assumption College, founded in 1904, provided a classical eight-year education to many French Canadians. I am proud of being from Claygon. I'm proud of the education I got at Assumption College, which gave me a beautiful background of French. It gave me a culture, not only the education, but in those days, the Assumptionist Father gave us culture with our education. It was a total education. Ethnic survival was also aided by numerous societies, as well as by a strong French-language newspaper, La Liberté, published in Fitchburg. The paper began publishing in 1908, and by 1937, La Liberté claimed a circulation of 7,120, one of the largest French newspapers in the country. A native Fitchburger, Joseph R. Benoit, served as its able editor until 1935, later to become mayor of Manchester, New Hampshire. A look at one of the rare copies from 1924 along with some photographs of the time, gives a great nostalgic glance back to the first generation French American immigrants.
Most societies in the French community were dedicated to preserving and furthering French-Canadian interests and social contacts. One of these, the Acadian Society of L'Assomption, was founded in Fitchburg with the initial participation and energy and inspiration of Elphar Leger. From its beginnings in 1902 until today, the Société L'Assomption has steadily grown and prospered, as have its thousands of members. It is now the very important and prestigious Assumption Mutual Life Insurance Company with $126 million of assets. And this is a strange contrast to its early humble beginnings of a few members meeting monthly in local councils to foster and encourage scholarships for the education of the children of its members. As a matter of fact, the narrator and his family have benefited from three such scholarships to both prep school, high school, and college. It is interesting to note that other French-Canadian organizations of importance included the Fraternal Union Saint-Jean-Baptiste d'Amérique and l'Association Canado-Américaine. Other organizations, such as Club Moreau, later to become the South Fitchburg Social Club, and of course the Gardonard St. Joseph. Organized in 1902 by a curate of St. Joseph's Church, the God provided splendid spectacle for many years. The Guy de Fongalin Drum and Bugle Corps was also very well known. Both groups were important in the development of several professional musicians. Amongst these are two particularly, one Paul Price, a teacher of music, and Gerard Gauguin, who played with the Boston Symphony Orchestra for 20 years. The bands were also a regular feature of Saint-Jean-Baptiste Day's annual July Parade. Political power still eluded the French community, in part because many French Canadians simply had not become citizens and could not vote. Along with various naturalization clubs, Frank P. Allen, a prominent Plagon businessman, probably helped and encouraged more French Canadians to become citizens than any other person in the community. The vote gave rise to politics. City councillor Henry Dextras reviews the rise of French Canadian political power. Back with the first French mayor that we had, Mayor Carrier, at the time it seemed as if it was almost, a, I shouldn't say a holy war, but an ethnic war. I remember, I was a young fellow at the time, that an article appeared on the Fitchburg Sentinel, and it was signed by the secretary of the nonpartisan party, and the ad went something along this line, as Fitchburg to become a second Quebec. Needless to say that the following day after the election, Mayor Carrier was elected mayor, and Fitchburg did not become a second Quebec, but it was the first time that the Franco-American had established a foothold in politics. Possibly out of the 40,000 population the city of Fitchburg had, I'm sure that the Franco-American represent approximately one-third of the population. But because of the joie de vivre that the Franco-Americans have, they never got too interested in politics, providing things were kept on an equilibrium, they were happy. But from the time of Mr. Deschamps, Mr. Carrier, Mr. Violet, Mr. Bastrash, Mr. Bellavo, they suddenly realized that to get the things that were necessary for their own welfare, that they had to get in politics. However, Often more is required than the vote to gain political power and influence in a city. In order to give French Canadians the same opportunities as other ethnic groups, the Cable Club was established. Vic Carpenter Jr., 